Hello and welcome to Common Ground, an inside look at Suffolk County. I'm your host, Sheriff Steve Tompkins. Now, you know, often we talk about youth, we talk about kids, and we talk about the things that affects their lives, uh, whether it's at home or in the school or just in the community. Uh, and to that end today, we have uh, Nikki, Nikki Fleonis, who is the executive director of Mission Safe. And what they do is really put their arms around kids that are having um, some, dare I say, uh, trauma, difficulty, or just trying to work their way through that maze of life, and uh, they get them to the other side uh, in a good and positive and healthy way. So, Nikki, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for having me. Really you. appreciate having you here. Why don't you give us the mission of uh, uh, the mission? Give us the mission of Mission Safe. The mission yeah. of Mission Safe <laughs> is to seek out young people who are facing obstacles, um, whether they've been in trouble with the law, failing in school, have behavior issues, and really pull them in, make them a part of Mission Safe. First, make them feel safe and bring out all the, the have people who bring out all the specialness of them, the talents and all of that, but then begin to challenge. And once you feel safe in this program, to move on and develop leadership and job readiness training, academic supports, and two things that we consider incredibly important, mm -hmm. which is um, horizon broadening, horizon broadening and personal growth. Mm -hmm. Our theory, as we talked a, a little bit about, is that most of the what we call high-risk and proven-risk young people, a term I don't really like because it obscures all their talents and potential, but most of them have come through a time where they have lost trust with the community. And, and by that I mean there are shootings that go on, whether you're involved in gangs or not. Right. Um, there are fights in the schools, from our homes right through the schools and communities. We have not yet found a way to keep our young people feeling safe. Okay. Even if sometimes we do keep them safe, we don't keep them feeling safe. And when that goes on and on and on, it really creates trauma, and particularly when it starts young and goes through. So we focus on helping young people, creating an atmosphere where they can heal from that trauma and as they heal, begin to be challenged. And two pieces that do that are the personal growth piece, which is having a chance to talk, among other things, and the horizon broadening piece, which is, you know, we work with great partners like Appalachian Mountain Club and the kids mm -hmm. climb the White mm -hmm. Mountains mm -hmm. and they go out to the Berkshires, we go canoeing, we do career visits with places like Deloitte and DeMambro and Associates and different and then college visits, which will do the wonderful colleges in Boston, but then we'll take off to Connecticut or UMass Amherst because the idea is to make the world larger and have our young people feel like they can work in the, and move in those worlds. So let me ask you a two-part question. One, what are the ages of the kids that you work with? And two, how do you find the kids? Are they sent to you from either the schools or the courts or the families, or do you go out and actively look for kids that have experienced some trauma? A mix of all of those. So the, the age ranges are roughly middle school, and we say 11 to 13, 14, mm -hmm. roughly high school age, which can be 14 up to 18 or 19, right. and then 19 to 24, 25. And there are distinct programs for, for all three groups. Okay. Um, when we first began, which was back about a decade or so ago, uh, we went out with business cards and just, we had been brought into uh, Mission Maine and Mission Hill on a consulting job mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and just saw the potential of all these kids and that there wasn't enough. There were great programs, but just not enough of them. Right. So we started Mission Safe and started going around and saying, hi, I'm Ann, I'm Nikki, I'm Wanda. We had a team and, mm -hmm. you know, come see us. And little by little, we began to get and we were aiming for the young people who were disengaged, not the ones already in the programs, mm -hmm. but the ones standing on the corner or getting involved and making a program where they participate, it's interactive, there are things they must do, right. like if we have a meeting and what everyone wants to do is field trips, well obviously we can't just do that, right. but there's input on what we do and how we do it. And one of our, this is going to seem simple, one of our most important questions to a young person is, what were you thinking? So we have an example from many years ago, not, not a recent example, of, of a couple of young men who had been coming to the program and working on their violence prevention skills. And uh, we do a small stipend program in, with our job readiness, and they had had their cell phones stolen mm -hmm. and their paychecks and got really upset and ended up getting arrested for stealing a car and trying to run over the young men who stole wow. it. So when okay. we got together at the 
courthouse, <laughs> we said, now what were you thinking? Now the answer was interesting, and, and this is difficult to say, but they said, well, we know we're not supposed to use guns. It's very dangerous and can kill people, but we didn't think we could go to the police. We didn't know what to say, so we figured we'd borrow a car Mm. and go after these guys and get our stuff back. Mm. Now, then we had to work on, okay, that was better than the first option, but it's not what the option should right, be. Right, right. But instead of just saying, that's it, you're suspended, you're not in the program, it was a chance for them to learn the lesson. Right? This is how right. it happened, do you see the consequence? What's the lesson? A teaching moment. A teaching moment, mm -hmm. and how do we move to the next level? And how do we move to it so when you're on the street, you can practice? Right. That's the hardest part. Right. It's the hardest part of right, all you know, of it. Because oftentimes kids will not, um, they, they, they will react and not right. realize that every action is going to have a right. reaction. Right. And so you need to take that time to process what's going on right. and just, if you, if you, that whole thing about count to 10. That's give right. Give yourself a That's chance right. just to count to 10, calm yourself down. You may, your actions may be a little bit different, right. but if you don't do that and it's just an impulsive move, That's, that's right. where you can wind up uh, in trouble. Exactly. And some of the brain science that, you know, we've learned this instinctively, like you working with young people on the streets, but right. now it's borne out that this fight or flight response, you know, comes from a little pathway mm -hmm. in our, our brain, the sort of primitive part of ourselves that want to survive. And every time you respond to it with anger, it's survival, but it gets worse. Mm -hmm. So you need to have those tools, count to 10, whatever tools we can devise together, right. that when something's about to happen, you take a breath right. and you do something else. Now here's the interesting thing. Every time a young person does something else and doesn't give in to that fight or flight, that amygdala, that, that primitive response, the brain rewires just a tiny bit toward the healthy side. So the more that you can work with young people to practice, like sometimes young people will say, you're asking us to fake it. We're really angry, but you want us to smile mm -hmm. and do this. Mm -hmm. And yes, it's not faking it. It's saying, I'm going to choose to be a little bit different and see how that feels to be what I would like to be or how I would like to be. And that actually begins to change their, their toolkit, their ability to respond. But you have to do it at first in a very safe place. Yeah, yeah. But you know something about when you said they want you or you want them to smile. You know, I think I remember years ago reading something about smiling and how the actual physical act of smiling um, has a reaction within your system right. and calms you down right. or reorients the way that you're thinking. Is that That's exactly right. And so mm -hmm. it's one of the tools. It mm -hmm. sounds funny, mm -hmm. it sounds hokey, but it actually works. Yeah. So it's being able to gain the trust among us, among all my staff and the young people, so that when you're talking about things like this, it actually makes some sense. And mm -hmm. people, I have found that the young people we work with really want to have a larger world Absolutely. and want to do the right thing. Right, right. It's just, you don't know how right, exactly. Because right. you're all the time wondering what's going to happen next, who's going to jump out, am I going to get shot, is someone going to jump me? That is complex ongoing trauma. So tell me this, now you say that you and your staff early on would go out and approach the kids mm -hmm. uh, standing around in the park or on the street corner. Right. Talk to me about the holistic aspect of it and, and folding the family into the situation once you've made contact with the kid, once the child is open to receiving right. the information that you're trying to give them, how do you weave in the family? Well, the, the key way that we do it is make an ally of the family. Mm -hmm. Families are at different levels, whether they're willing to really be involved and they want to be involved or they don't want any part of it yet. Mm -hmm. But everyone wants to know that you think their child is just wonderful, mm -hmm. has great potential. <laughs> and well, truly, and we do think I they know, are I wonderful know. and have great I potential. Right, I mean, right, it's true. Right. And you then have a parent who's on your side and you can begin a conversation yeah. about how we work together. We also go into the schools because a lot of times young people are not doing well in school or not going often enough or coming late for right. all of these reasons right. that you know, people tend to say they just don't want to go to school. Right. They're doing this on purpose. They're getting in trouble. But it's part of this. You haven't learned the tools to do it. It's your survival toolkit, how you survive on the street, and it doesn't translate well to the mainstream world. So the interesting thing about what you're saying, then, is I would venture to say that some of the families, the parents of the kids, may have gone through the same type of situations yes. and trauma when they were you when that's, they were young that's and that's always the thing there's for a variety of reasons kids having kids is not a good thing 
but when that happens, it kind of feeds on itself, would you say? You know? It does, and it means as the parents start to become an ally, they have a longer journey in a way, because we right. adults don't change and adapt as quickly right. as, exactly. as young people. Exactly. But they have to go through their own journey now, and some folks are ready earlier than others to do it. Mm -hmm. So we, we bring the family, the piece together, but we also deal with it separately, because sometimes the young person will just grow a little more quickly, and we try to go at the pace that people are ready to go and do what we're able to do. Now, that said, we are not highly resourced, so we also have to make judgments sometimes on what we can afford to do right, and then right, tend right, to concentrate right. more on the young people. How big is your organization? How many folks do you have? We work with about 225 a year in enrolled programs, uh -huh. and then 100 or so, give or take, where the outreach team goes out to reach out to them. They may not be ready to come into the pipeline yet, but we do a lot of mediation when there are going to be fights or guns are drawn or things right. of that nature. And how long are the program? Are they weeks or months long? Well, our program goes year round. So it's an okay. And you stay as long as you think you need to stay. Okay. okay. And okay. Uh, as we tell alums, alums are always mission safe. They're always a part of us wherever they are. We're on Facebook Good. partly to find and connect Good. As, Good. as they Good. move on. And how big is your staff? Staff is very small. There's only seven of us. Okay. And we are hoping as, as we've as I said, we did not do well in the recession, but we've come back and we've raised 250000 over where we were two mm -hmm. or three years ago, okay. and this is great. Okay. We have another 200000 or so to go to be able to fully staff up. Now, that said, we keep somewhat small on purpose. I wouldn't want to exceed 300 at this point. Mm -hmm. We have two sites, one in Mission Hill and one in Charlestown, mm -hmm. unless we were able in the future years to start a third site. Right. Because to do this kind of intensive relational, what were you thinking work. Right. You can't have a thousand kids coming in and out unless you have an enormous staff. Now do you work in conjunction with other programs? Absolutely. If we, we couldn't do it without partners. We're, we're the stone soup program. Gotcha. You know, we bring the pot of water <laughs> <laughs> and the I ideas that. and that is funny. We, we have partners from Mission Hill Youth Collaborative sure. to bring them in Women's Hospital, Tufts Medical Center, Appalachian Mountain Club, the schools, the police department. There's no way to do it without all of us talking to each other and bringing some resources in. What's the importance or, yeah, what is the importance of your youth leadership uh, core? Talk to us about that. The importance of that, we started it actually because it became clear early on that just being an academic program, although we mm -hmm. do work on academics, with the young people we work with, that's their zone of failure. So if we're saying, well, come on, you gotta go to school, get better grades. Now we do work on that, we don't say better grades, we say improvement. Better attendance if a grade goes up. But, but that, we had to start with, what does everybody need? They need some money, a little stipend. They need some pride to be involved in something good. It, so they do community service every single month, different places. That's part of the leadership core. To learn leadership and communication skills, one, because communication is one of your tools, one of our tools for working, but also it's the way you reach out and, and be heard mm -hmm. in the world, and everyone wants to be heard. So we started Youth Leadership Service Corps to give a stipend, to develop these peer leadership, you know, you can lead a meeting, you can mobilize for jobs or whatever it happens to be, but also so inside, you begin to feel confident and secure that you have a set of skills. And then when we do community service, the response, a lot of young people are used to it now because we do so much of it. Mm -hmm. But the response is always, wow, I have made a difference here. Yeah. Our young people, they may have gone through obstacles, they may have started out feeling like victims, but they're not victims. They have strength and talents, they can make a difference. It's getting them to understand that they can and helping them like we all need the tools to actually do it. And so that's the heart of that. Does your organization then help your kids get into college and or find employment? 